Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. So today's video is going to be a little bit different than the stuff you've seen us do in the past. Based on your questions and a lot of feedback that we've gotten, and I truly appreciate it. I think I can say that for both me and my wife, as well as what we received personally ever since we announced and showed that we were going on our new construction home journey was how do you buy a new construction home? So if you are in the process of buying a home, especially a new construction home, then this is the exact video for you. I want to break down fully in detail the process, which applies to both new construction and resale homes. And I'm also going to give you some tips and tricks along the way. And if you stay tuned to the end, I'm going to show you and tell you exactly why now is the right time to buy, regardless of what anyone else is telling you and prices are not going down. This is not 2008 again. All right, so first things first, let's get into these loan programs, right? So every time you get ready to buy a home, you hear all these different terms, you know, should you go conventional? Should you go FHA? If you qualify for VA, is that the you know, right route for you to go? So I'm gonna break this down without going into too much detail because actually each one of these topics can be its own video, right? So first things first, let's talk about FHA. So there are some pros and cons to FHA versus some of the other loan programs. One of the biggest advantages of going FHA is it allows you to put down only 3.5% of your loan amount. Now, the downside to that is FHA does have a limit cap. Now, it does vary between your province, your city, your state, your area. So you need to look that up to see what is the FHA limit for your area. But whatever that limit is, that is the maximum amount that the loan amount can be. Now, for example, let's say the FHA limit in your area is $350,000. That does not mean you can't buy a $360,000 house. It just means that if the 3.5% that you're putting down doesn't bring the loan amount to under $350,000, you have to bring in an additional amount of money to make the loan amount three fifty. dollars did, did that make sense? Did that make sense? It did? Okay. So let me break it down a different way. So if the using this, let's let's use these same numbers, three hundred and fifty thousand. I'm doing this off the top of my head, so if my numbers are wrong. I don't know what side I'm gonna put it on, but if the numbers are wrong, don't judge me. So at three hundred and fifty thousand dollars, I believe three and a half percent is ten thousand five hundred dollars, right? So if I put down ten thousand five hundred dollars on a three hundred and fifty thousand dollar house, that means that my loan amount is three hundred and thirty five thousand. No, that means my Loan amount is $339,500, if my numbers are right. So that's well within the FHA limit. Now, if you go above that, like I said, $360,000, $370,000, then you have to put down 3.5%. And after you subtract that from your loan amount, if it's not below the FHA limit for your area, you just have to bring the difference. So that's the key to FHA. Also, another benefit to FHA is it allows you to have a higher debt to income ratio from conventional loans. So if you don't know what a debt to income ratio is, get a pen and paper. I'm actually gonna break this down and show you how you can figure out really, really close what your personal debt to income ratio is as it pertains to like buying a house. So you wanna take what your gross monthly income is. So let's say you make $5,000 a month, right? That's $60,000 a year. You want to pull your credit report and you want to look at all your revolving debt and all your installment debt. So you want to pull up your revolving and installment debt and write down those numbers. So if you have a car note, that car note is $500 a month, write that down. If you have a, um, I don't know, a credit card and you have a $700 balance and the monthly minimum payment is $25, write that down. And that's a really key, that's a tip. So when you're looking at the credit report, they, and you have credit cards, they want to know what is a minimum monthly payment. Not how much you owe, not what the total balance is. They look at the minimum monthly payment that's reported on your credit card statement, and they use that number against your debt to income ratio. You also want to look at any other installment loans. If you, take out a, if you took out a personal loan, if you have student loans, that's a little bit different. If you have an amortized payment plan where you know you, you signed up and you, hey, I'm going to pay you guys back over 20 years, in that amount, they will use that. But now that's changed where they'll take either 1% of the loan amount or they'll take a half percent depending on your loan program. Um, they're, they're still working that out. But that student loans are a little bit different. But generally speaking, you want to take your credit report, 
and itemize and write down everything that you have that you pay monthly and get that total amount. So let's say after looking at your credit report and you write down, let's say you have um, $1,000 in installment and revolving debt showing on your credit report. And then they're going to factor in what your new monthly mortgage payment will be. So let's say for simple numbers, that's going to be $1,500 a month. So your $1,000 in current debt that you have, plus the $1,500 for your new mortgage, that's $2,500 per month. Then they're going to look at your monthly income, your gross monthly income, which is $5,000. Divide the two, you have a 50% debt to income ratio. Now, with FHA loans, you typically can go a little bit higher. The gold standard is you want to be under 50%, right? But with FHA, sometimes you can go high 55, even close to 60% sometimes. Don't quote me on that. Talk to a loan officer or a mortgage banker or a mortgage broker. They'll help you out get to those exact numbers. But typically, you can go a lot higher with FHA. Conventional is a different beast. It's a little different. But that's how you can calculate your debt-to-income ratio. Another thing to consider, right, with FHA is you have what is called mortgage insurance premium. You may hear it referred to as MIP. So the way that works is the government is backing the FHA loan that says if you default, if you go into foreclosure, then they will pay back or give the lender a portion of the money. I'm not sure exactly what that amount is, but they'll give a portion of the amount that you defaulted to the lender. That's why they could be a little bit more lenient with lending the money because the government is backing it, so to speak, right? But with the mortgage insurance premium, they charge you this. Sometimes they charge it up front in the closing costs or they roll it into the loan. But generally speaking, the MIP is something that every FHA buyer pays. And it goes into a, almost like think of it like it goes into a fund to help pay back those that have defaulted. So you pay a little bit. The next person pays a little bit. The next person pays a little bit into the fund. And then if you know, John or Jane Doe default, then they have a pool where they can pay to the bank to make sure that um, they're compensated. So that's why those loan details can be a little bit more lenient when it comes to FHA. Again, the downside to that is you cannot get rid of it. The only way you can get rid of it is refinance your loan out of FHA and into a conventional product. The bad part with that is right now rates are phenomenal, right? We have you know historically low interest rates, you know, high twos to low threes. So if you lock in one of those fantastic rates right now under FHA loan and rates go up and you have to refinance, you lose that rate. All right. So then we have conventional loans. Now, this is what majority of the people um, that are financing go with. One of the biggest reasons that you have higher loan limits without it being a jumbo loan. So I think right now you can get up to, I think it's over 600,000 before it's considered a jumbo. Again, don't quote me on that. I'll put the actual number um, somewhere here on the screen. But a conventional loan does allow you to um, borrow higher uh, amounts. That's one of the biggest advantages to conventional. The downside is the debt to income ratio, which we just talked about, is a lot stricter. It's really important with a conventional loan to be about 40 to 45 percent. Now, granted, when you're thinking about a mortgage and everything, it's, it's a balancing act, right? So the higher your credit score, the more lenient they can be and maybe nudge those numbers a little bit higher on your debt to income ratio. The more assets that you have. So, you know, if you have somebody with really good credit and they have a lot of money in the bank, they have a lot of assets or reserves, as we call it, and their debt to income ratio is a little bit higher, the computer that spits out the approvals will likely consider that person a little bit more favorable than somebody that had a barely qualifying credit score and a higher debt to income ratio. So it, it's a balancing act. Now, that doesn't mean if you have an 800 credit score that you can go get a loan with a 70 DTI. That's just not going to happen. But the better the other areas of your application are, there is a little wiggle room to go higher um, depending on the loan program. Now, most people say that conventional loans are more difficult to get. And the reason they used to say that is, again, prior to the shutdown that was caused by the pandemic, FHA borrowers can typically borrow at a credit score of about 580. But conventional loans were really 620, and then some banks were even requiring a much higher credit score, 680, 720, to even be considered. So it's not that the program itself is more difficult, it's just that sometimes the parameters 
I guess you can say, are a little bit more strict. So that may make it seem like it's more difficult to get. But for the most part, conventional loans are still really obtainable if you're looking to buy outside of that FHA price point. Now with conventional loans, you can get away with 5% down as a minimum. And in some cases you can even do 3%. It really just depends on the loan program and if your particular financial institution allows that or has a program for that. But general rule of thumb is 5% down on a conventional loan is the minimum that you would need. Now, the more you put down, you can sometimes get a better rate. Or again, you will have a little bit more wiggle room with some of the other parameters, such as your credit score or the debt to income ratio. Now, the biggest difference or one of the biggest differences between FHA and conventional is conventional loans have that mortgage insurance premium as well. Now, I didn't mention this in the last part, but it's not the same insurance that you would have if your home burned down. That's a separate type of insurance and it's just really bad wording. But hey, that's what it's called. But on a conventional, it's private mortgage insurance. On FHA, it's mortgage insurance premium. They're generally the same thing. But the difference is with a conventional loan, once you establish 20% equity in your home, you can get rid of the PMI without having to refinance. So again, if you lock in at a historically low rate like we have right now, and you put down 5%, and let's say in a couple years you pay down your mortgage, it appreciates in value, and you get that 20% threshold in equity in your home, you can then you know, reach out to your lender and they can remove the private mortgage insurance, which can be a couple hundred dollars a month from your payment without you having to refinance or lose your rate. All right, so let's talk about these credit scores. So there's a lot of bad information out there about credit scores or you know what do the lenders use, and I, I see this every day in my line of work, right? So I'm actually gonna give you, in my opinion, the most foolproof way. I have vetted this, I have tested this numerous of times to find out exactly what your credit score is prior to you having your lender pull your credit. So your credit karmas, your identity IQs, your any of these other places that you're pulling your credit score and you see these various, you know, one place says your TransUnion or your Equifax is a 680 and the next place says it's a 540. I'm going to give you the tips. I'm going to give you the exact information how to find out. So in my opinion, this is only my opinion, the best place to go to find out what your true mortgage score is, is myfico.com. This is not sponsored by them. They didn't pay me to say this. I wish they would, but they didn't. The reason that my FICO to me is the gold standard is because I know for a fact that you can pull your 542 credit score. Now I'm going to explain what that means. So everybody knows FICO is the gold standard and they have you know, vantage scores and things of that nature that will show you a different type scoring model. That's what Credit Karma and uh, depending on your credit card, if they ever show you, like when you log in, if they ever show you like what your credit score is, either on the app or on the computer, those are usually Vantage scores, unless it specifically says FICO. So with your mortgage scores, and I have my phone here just so I make sure I say it correctly. If you sign up for myfico.com and you get your consumer scores, that's not even what the lenders use. 99% of the lenders right now, and you can even ask this question prior to them running your credit, and most of them should know, at least the good ones would. You can ask them which version of the credit score are they pulling. So when you sign up MyFICO, and after you look at your consumer scores, you can switch over to the mortgage view. Under mortgages, there's a couple of different ones you look at, but the one you want says FICO score 5, 4, and 2. What that is, is Equifax version 5, TransUnion version 4, and Experian version 2. So every time there is a nuance change, the bureaus release a new scoring method or a new scoring methodology to determine your score. And, you know, for example, a couple of years back, I forget which version it was, but they no longer counted uh, collections less than $100. So what that means is, let's say they were on version, I think it was version 9 or version 8 that that changed. So let's say in version 7, you had a $95 collection account and it was hurting your score. Maybe it was affecting you 15, 20 points. When the new version came out, 
and they no longer weighed that into the equation, you may have got a score increase. So these different versions or variations of the credit scores are determined by the lenders and it takes a while for them to get adopted. But I can almost assure you that every major lender that you're going to apply with for a mortgage is going to use my FICO version 542. And if they don't, you can ask them. But with my FICO, again, you can pull that up and see for yourself. I give you a real life story as far as what happened with me as we were going through our um, bill process. You know, I qualified. My scores are good. We were good to go. But again, like I uh, like I mentioned previously, sometimes you will get a better rate if your scores are a little bit higher. Sometimes if you have a 719, usually the threshold may be like 720. So one point difference can cost you a quarter of a point or so. So um, right before we were about to close, I pulled up my FICO. And I, I bought the report to refresh my credit and get it immediately as opposed to waiting 30 days because I had just paid off one of my credit cards. And I got maybe a 15, 20 point jump. And I remember I rolled over, called my loan officer. I told her to pull my credit again. She pulled it. Boom. The same uh, score that I saw on my phone was the exact same one that she got. And uh, it lowered my, I think it lowered the interest rate half a point. I went from three and a quarter to three and a quarter to 2.75, just based on that small little jump. So I, I stand by this. I've told many of my friends and I told many of my clients the same thing and it has worked out for every one of them. But hey, do your own due diligence. I'm pretty sure it's gonna be somebody that says otherwise in the comments. I welcome it, bring it on. But I guarantee you, my FICO mortgage scores, and I think Experian may have it, I'm not sure, I don't really use it. But I know my FICO mortgage scores will give you the exact information that you need. All right, so now we've talked about credit. We've talked about debt to income ratio. We've talked about the best loan programs or the difference between FHA and VA, or not VA, FHA and conventional loans. Let's get into this savings, the money, what really matters. So there's a lot of confusion about how much money you actually need to have saved up prior to buying a home, and specifically with new construction. Typically, you want to have three to four months of whatever your new monthly mortgage is in reserves after your closing costs. Now, another big question that people ask is, well, how much are my closing costs? Like, how much are I going to have to bring to the table? That is something that concerns a lot of people. Generally speaking, and I mean, when I say closing costs, I mean all the stuff that's your title, all the lender costs, your check, the amount that you have to bring to the closing table is typically going to be about three to four percent of the loan amount on average. If you want to go right in the middle and say three and a half percent and shoot for that, go for it. But generally three to four percent of the loan amount is going to be the total of what you would need to bring um, to the closing table. Now if you get seller concessions or if you get a incentive if you're buying new construction that can help lower your closing costs. But generally speaking that is the rule of thumb three and a half, I'm sorry, three to four percent will be your closing costs. So that kind of brings me to my next point. Aside from your closing costs, and we're gonna get into the new construction aspect of it. Like a lot of the other information was really geared to general. It can go either way, new construction or uh, resale homes. Now we're gonna get into the nitty gritty of the new construction aspect of it. So some new construction builders and homes and neighborhoods are a little bit different. You know, a, a new construction home is just that one that was just constructed. So you have some neighborhoods where the homes are kind of put up. You kind of walk in, you see it, you buy it. There's not a lot of input from the buyer. And then you have custom builders where you pick every single detail. I'm more so focused on the ones that are in the middle where you are going to pick a plan, you pick your lot, and you pretty much choose all the details of your home. So not quite custom, but definitely a step up or two from your just plain new construction walk in and buy type homes. So generally there's gonna be some money due at the time of contract, right? When you go into a new construction home and even with the resale, you know, you have to put earnest money, but with new construction, it's a little bit different. Now, you definitely wanna find out, this is a tip here, how much is the earnest money due at the time of contract? You have some builders where it's gonna be a flat amount. It could be as low as a couple hundred dollars, as much as a couple thousand dollars. I'm talking 20, $30,000 in earnest money that's due at the time of contract. So depending on your builder or, you know, the couple of builders that you're looking at, you know, find that information out um, even before you decide to go forward. And, you know, it makes a huge difference because that money you have to have before you can even commit to the house. 
Some of the other things you can have time to save for. But if you fall in love with a plan and a lot or a house and you want that house and that lender says you need $30,000 as earning money, as earnest money, then you obviously have to come up with that money. So you want to find out how much that is and what it's due at the time of contract. Typically, your earnest money is also given back as a credit towards your closing costs. That is generally how it's done, but it doesn't have to be. So you want to ask that question when you're you know, talking to your builder. All right, so after you've signed your contract, after you've put down your earnest money, now it's time for the fun part. That's when you get to go to the design center. You know, not every builder has a design center. Sometimes you're just picking a package. So this is not really catered towards that aspect of it. This is more so for the semi-custom or the custom home where you get to go to a showroom and pick out you know, every detail from your countertops, your backsplash, your floor, what type of corners or arches and things of like that that you want. This is more so for that. So another key thing that you need to find out is what is the design center upgrade policy? Now, we did a video breaking down our full design center experience and how much we spent or overspent, and I'll link it right here. But when you go to the design center, everybody's a little bit different. So what I mean by that is when you pick your selections, obviously there's a cost involved and you may or may not have um, an incentive from the builder. But depending on the balance that you have left, sometimes you have to put down a percentage of what's left. So if you go to the design center and you spend $30,000 and you have to put down 10%, then that's a $3,000 no, $3, check that you have to write. If you go to the design center and like some other builders, you have to put down 50% and you spend $30,000, then you have to write a $15,000 check. So you want to know that process at the design center ahead of time, because generally speaking, you're going to go to the design center within usually two to three weeks after you sign your contract. And since that earnest money deposit and since all your deposits at the design center are due in a relatively short time, you want to make sure that you have the money saved up prior to going to contract. And you don't count that as towards your money that you're going to save um, you know, for your closing costs, because you still have time to save that amount if you don't have it all at the time of contract. But you want to do your due diligence and find out exactly how much your earnest money is again. And you want to find out what is the design center um, process. You know, is it a percentage of how much you spend? It is a certain amount. Is it, you know, whatever it may be, you want to find out what that is, because that's going to help determine how much you need before you go to contract. So really quick, I just want to kind of recap. We've gone over your loan programs, again, FHA versus conventional, the pros and cons to each one. We've gone over the credit score, you know, how to find the right credit score that the lenders are actually going to use. We've gone over, you know, savings, how much you're going to need and the right questions to ask at the time of contract or before you even go to contract to determine how much you need to have in the bank. We've talked about, you know, saving for your closing costs and how much that is. So we've covered a lot of different things. But one of the more pressing things that I hear all the time is everybody knows that since around the middle of last year till today, we've had a huge surge in home prices where people are paying hundreds, sometimes even no, where people are paying thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars over asking price just to secure a home. You've seen new construction prices soar due to lumber, supply and demand and various other reasons. And the one thing that people keep saying is, well, I'm just going to sit it out and wait. I'm going to wait to two th like it's going to crash again like it did in 2008. And in my opinion, 2008, it's not going to happen again. I'm talking about the housing crash of 2008. So if you break that down and look at why home prices dropped in 2008, you will quickly see that's not the case in 2021, 2022 going forward. And I'm going to break that down. I actually posted about this a couple months back, so I'm gonna grab my phone so I don't miss any key points and kind of reiterate that to you guys right now. All right, so again, I just wanna reiterate, if you're on the fence and you're financially able to buy a home right now and your only reason is, I believe home prices are going to drop, stop what you're doing, get ready to buy a house tomorrow. Do not wait any longer because I'm gonna explain exactly why. If you think 2008 is gonna happen again, it's not. This is strictly my opinion. Do what you want. As someone who's been in finance and new construction home sales for the last 15 to 18 years, I feel pretty confident when I say this. So 
we have to look at the factors. What played into the what really played into the housing crash of 2008? So actually, at that time, 2006, 7, 8, I was actually doing uh, loans at the time for you know home mortgages. We had very I don't want to say predatory, but we had loans that. How can I say this? Um, people should have never taken out. So one of the, I'll give you an example. We had what was called a NINA loan. So N-I-N-A. It stood for no income, no asset. And that meant exactly how it sounds. Generally speaking, at that time, if a person have a 720 credit score, I could state their income. I could state their assets with very minimal, if any, verification through underwriting. So if you came up to me and you wanted to buy a $500,000 house and you made $40,000 a year, you had the credit score to qualify, so 720 plus, I could put whatever information on that application that was needed in order for, or I couldn't, you could put whatever information on that application and that loan would typically go through if your credit score was high enough. We also had adjustable rate mortgages. So an adjustable rate mortgage means that there's a period of time where you pay interest only, so no principal. And typically a full mortgage payment will be principal, interest, taxes, and in homeowner's insurance. So this allowed you to remove the principal part of it and pay just the interest, which lowered your payment. So back then, I don't know the exact numbers, but let's just say you had a $300,000 home that would typically be a $2,000 a month payment, full pity payment, principal, interest, taxes, and insurance. Well, if you went to an ARM, an adjustable rate mortgage, that payment would be interest only plus taxes and insurance. So that $2,000 a month payment would then be lowered to, let's say, $1,600 a month. So it made it more affordable. But then what happens is the banks borrow from the Federal Reserve Bank. A lot of people think the Federal Reserve is a government entity. It is not. So your banks borrow money from the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve charges them interest. The banks lend it to us, and they charge us more interest. So what happened was the Fed funds rate, which is the rate that the banks pay back to the Federal Reserve, went up. So when the interest rates went up and those adjustable rate mortgages came time to adjust, the payments went through the roof. So that same person that was paying only $1,600 a month that should have been paying $2,000 a month just had it adjust, and now their payment is $2,600, $2,700 a month. Now, those numbers may not be exact, but you get the idea. So that meant that people could no longer afford these houses, so they let the houses go. When you have an influx of foreclosed properties hit the market, it devalues a neighborhood, it devalues a city, and it happened all across the U.S., so the key component to the housing crash was not just home prices. It was the fact that you had a lot of people that couldn't afford their homes, let their homes go, and it created an infrastructure where you have a bunch of homes that were well below market value. And real estate is based off of comps, right? So if I have a home and your home is identical to mine and you live across the street and I sell mine for $290,000, guess how much your home is worth? 290, give or take a few thousand dollars if you have a couple upgrades or you've done some nicer things to your home. But if we have the identical house and I sell mine for 180, guess how much yours is worth now? 180. So when you have all of those homes hit the, you know, those foreclosed homes hit the market, it completely wiped out the value of neighborhoods. So that's what caused the housing crash. It was a lot of the predatory or, um, less than stellar loan requirements combined with um, the economy at the time that led that to happen. Now, today, the lending requirements are pretty strict. Not strict that it's difficult to get, but they're strict in returns in regards to they're going to make sure that you can qualify for the home before they authorize the loan. So people that are buying houses now, they aren't buying houses that they can't afford if something were to happen because of the Fed funds rate or anything that happened prior to 2008 or during 2008. It's completely different now. So I don't think home prices are going to go down anytime soon. The parameters which caused the crash in 2008 are very different from 2021. And if anything, I think home prices are going to go higher. 
I don't think it's going to accelerate as fast in the next six months as it did in the previous six months. But I can almost assure you, whatever house you're looking at today is going to be more in December than it is today. So if you have the means, again, I've been stressing this to everybody, all my clients, friends. If you can buy a house, you have the means, you have the ability to buy so, do so now. And if you don't have the means and you're close, save up, do whatever you have to do, because the dream of home ownership for a lot of people is going to become a thing of the past very soon. Or you're going to end up buying a home that is less than a quality that you probably want. So now is the time. Now is the time. Now is the time. So I want to thank you guys for tuning in and watching this video. I really, really hope it was helpful. If you have any additional comments or you need me to clarify anything, please leave them in the comments below. I look forward to answering all your questions. Again, I hope this was helpful. Please stay tuned. We have another video coming out very soon. It's going to be more, more on brand, more vlogs, things of that nature. But I just wanted to get this out because a lot of you have been asking this question. And I looked all over the Internet and I really didn't see anything as comprehensive. So I wanted to give my spin on it and put it out again. Thank you for watching. If you made it this far, I truly, truly appreciate it. Until the next video. Peace.